Hi there, it's Anna Vaughn with Travel Mama Anna Vaughn, and today we're doing a Q&A video. I asked you guys to ask me whatever you wanted to know, and tons of people wrote in, and thanks so much for that. I picked the top questions, and today we're going to go around Puerto Escondido, show you a little bit of our town, and I'm going to answer questions along the way. If you like this video, you can share it, you can subscribe, and you can even hit the little bell and get notified when we upload. Anyway, here we go. Strap in. It's going to be fun. So before I answer the first question, I'm just going to set up our day. We came to this place called Elephant, which Elephant Garden, which I love. It's an expat owned spot on Zicatella in the main beach, just up a side road. And I would say it's my favorite cafe in town right now. In the car on the way over, in the taxi, Luna fell asleep on the window. So we made her a little bed out of two chairs. And she's just having a little well-deserved nap there. And I am having this incredible breakfast. It's just scrambled eggs on a homemade bagel with some great side like veggies and a great sauce. But what I love about here is like the details. My green tea came with lime in it. They always bring you out a big bottle of water with lime. They sell artisanal products inside. The garden's really, it's really just a dirt backyard, but they've turned it into a beautiful garden. It gets a really nice mix of locals, the people actually eating behind me, and we'll just sneak in on them. That's the family that owns Senior Salud, which is um, an organic local grocery store that we go to, and I featured it in videos in the past. And they're like here having their Sunday brunch. And um, you meet lots of, I meet lots of Mexican tourists here from the city. I always meet people from Dayefe here. This has a real city vibe. You know, a lot of what's on the beach is like, you know, really, the food's really cheap, but the price is expensive, you know, like kind of, you know, crappy kind of frat feeling like, you know, like any beach town always has like, you know, cheap trinkets and like chicken fingers. You know, like overpriced drinks and whatever, you know, plastic straws and stuff. And like they have that on the beach here. And this place is a little bit away, and it's like this is where people that live here go, or seasoned tourists, or always urban tourists always look for that little cafe. And there are a bunch of great restaurants in Puerto Escondido, but you have to like know where they all are. Anyway, buen provecho. Okay, question number one. This one's from Desi Cakes, who is in Los Angeles, California, United States. And she asked me, what part of Mexico do I recommend? This is like a crazy loaded question. When I first started traveling through Mexico, I kept on finding more interesting places. I had already been here many times on vacation, growing up, like all Canadians. and. I was so close-minded and dumb about how Mexico functioned because I had only seen that. I really actually thought that like Mexico was like this country they show in the movies with like dusty roads and cowboy hats and crime and like things going down and looks and whatever and mariachi bands and big mustaches and tequila and that there was like beach parts that Mexicans didn't use but that you know were for tourism and they just like built hotels and made money off us and we came down and like lounged from our stressful lives there. This was actually my idea and now looking back, I mean I would call it racist if it wasn't just so ignorant. Like it was, it's just, I was just so ignorant. I was. Um, of course Mexicans go to the beach and that is what I really love about this country is that Mexicans are a lot like Americans. They travel within their own country a lot. And so what's really cool about here is that unlike places that I've lived in Central America, like Gracias, Gracias, like, um, you know, Nicaragua, or even to some extent Guatemala, although not as much, you know, it's very separated foreigners and locals. You know, somewhere like Nicaragua, like there aren't a lot of local restaurants because there's not a lot of locals eating out. There's like a huge economic disparity between people that visit and people that live there. And it, it, now that frustrates me because of course when I go to a country I want to meet the countrymen. What's great about Mexico is that it's massively economically diverse, there's a huge middle class, 
There's lots of ways to see the country. You can fly around, but you can also bus. The ADO bus system is great. People take overnight buses everywhere. It's incredibly affordable. Um, you know, like 30 bucks Canadian a ticket um, to go overnight across the country. And it's really, the stations are safe. Every station I've ever been to in the middle of the night felt sta safe, even if it was on the side of the road in Pachutla. Um, so because of that, there are so many places to see it, see here. There are, every town seems like has a provincial airport that gets a lot of use. Um, Mexicans, like I said, are moving around and there's just like, you know, there's a lot going on here. So it depends on what you like. What I like, and I can tell you that, is in my mind, this country sit, split into two parts. There's like, the Caribbean coast, you know, Yucatan, Quintana Roo, even down into Campeche, uh, that kind of area that is really well touristed. That's where like Cancun, Plato, Carmen, Tulum, Bacalar, Merida, all that's over there. And then there's like the Pacific side of the country, which in my mind, like I split it down the middle. So in my mind, it's like Veracruz is the split on my side of the country. It's like Chiapas, San Cristobal, Las Casas, Oaxaca, uh, Mexico City, Quedetro, um, and then for like the real touristy stuff, it would be like Puerto Escondido, uh, Sayulita, Guadalajara, um, and then even up kind of into Baja California, I would consider like this side. So for me, after seeing both sides, I have like almost cut the other side out. Not that I wouldn't go vacation there, but I'll probably never live over there. It's too Americanized for me. There are too many foreigners, too many of a certain type of foreigner that's not our thing. Like very like gated community, needs to have everything air conditioned, buys their food at a Walmart, eats fast food, like very sort of Guy Fieri. I don't even know if I'm saying his name right. Uh, like that's like five star eating. Uh, <laughs> freedom sushi rolls and like Texas living you know and if that's your thing like that suburban Texas living there's so much of that available to you here in Mexico like I'm not even convinced that's an American that's an Americana thing anymore like I'm starting to think that's Mexican and Americans adopted it because it's so prevalent here that type of like Americana cowboy hat deal that uh, it feels really Mexican to me and then there's like the European side of the country. And Mexico's much more European than Canada, for instance. And that's all over here. So that's in Mexico City. That's where the art is. This is where the colonial towns are, where the cobblestones are. This is San Miguel Allende being like kind of the most famous. And some of those places are also crawling with tourists, San Miguel Allende, for instance. It's a different type of tourism. It's a different type of retiree. It's the type of retiree that would probably go to France in the past and is coming here instead now. Um, I like the desert. I like the big desert sky. I like the Pacific Ocean. It's It can be flat and it can be gnarly down here. The gnarly keeps the tourists out. The flat attracts them. Um, it feels more Mexican to me over here. You need a bit more Spanish. You meet more Mexicans over here traveling with their families, vacationing. My Mexicans know how to relax in a way that I've never seen anywhere in my life. And I feel I have a lot to learn. You know, Mexicans work really, really hard, but when it's time for their day off, like it's on another level, it's an art form. Like they can relax on a level that I, I need to get on like 110%. And I'm more exposed to that here. I feel like I get more like of the multiculturalism that is inside. It's like a very multifaceted culture, uh, Mexico. And Mexicans are different than the rest of Latin America for sure. Um, there's commonalities, but there is, there is something distinct about being Mexican and within that, there's so much diversity. Like what, what somebody calls Mexican in Monterey is so different than what somebody in Chiapas does. And the whole place is worth exploring. And if you can have it perfect, I would take a month and just look at it all. Okay, so the next question is from Jessica the Leo. Um, she's in Maryland. United States? She's in the United States. I'm trying to remember what I wrote down. It's in my phone, of course. Anyway, she asked me 
how is it crossing borders? Have I ever driven? And, you know, I think this question was really interesting to me because, of course, I've, I mean, I've crossed to tons and tons of borders, but this is becoming a question that travelers have that they didn't used to have. More and more, this is a concern. Um, you know, mainly because the United States and Europe, most of Western Europe and the United States are essentially closing their doors to some foreigners. So, how is it? Um, have I driven? I have. I have gone by chicken bus, actually, through Central America with my dog. I went from Nicaragua to Guatemala, um, crossing Honduras and El Salvador by myself and with friends many, many times. I've also taken that by shuttle and I've also flown to most of those countries. Uh, I also traveled seven months pregnant from Guatemala to Mexico over that border in Marsella and I traveled back and forth over that border with a baby by myself many, many times by land and I moved over the damn thing twice, uh, which is insanity. So. I've done that border. Now having said all that, and I've never had any problems. I've never had any problems traveling with a dog. I've never had any problems with a baby. I've never had any problems with myself. I've never had any problems in any country. I backpacked through, you know, Europe in the 90s when it was totally like unsafe and the thing to do. And with a bunch of girls just like dumb 19 backpacker and the worst thing that ever happened is my friend Lee got her camera stolen but she did leave it on a table and I think we were in Spain and they were like really known for theft then and it was like one of those like she should have never done it she made a donation so have I ever had any problems it's hard to say answer this question honestly because my experience as a white Canadian woman does not at all say anything about what the experience of a woman of color with a different passport would have. Um, Luna, I was recently invited to the United States to speak at a very big famous company um, about being a travel mama and traveling with a kid all over the world on our channel and stuff. And um, I didn't decline outright, but when we started talking about San Francisco, my immediate thought was, you know, Luna has a Canadian and a Mexican passport. There's a travel warning for Mexicans to go to the US right now since they're being openly shot. Um, and, you know, kids are being put in cages right now at the border. Like, there's some really creepy Nazi Germany level stuff going on. And I don't want to go to the... Oh, first of all, I'm boycotting the States anyway. I don't vacation there. I don't have to go there. And I feel like because I am privileged enough that I don't have to go there, I don't have family there, I'm not from there, I don't work there, then I can make a choice not to go there and not to support what's going on, which I've done. But also... I'm petrified that we're gonna go and they're gonna change the rules that her Canadian passport's null and void and the fact that she's Mexican means she's gonna end up in a dog crate with no water and no rights and I can't get her out. Mama. Somebody just woke up here. Are you hungry? So, I mean, in my white single mom privileged life, the worst thing that's ever happened to me is once when I was entering Canada, I was asked with Luna if I was the sole parent. Our pa we both have Canadian passports, we have the same last name. And I said, yeah. And the guy at the border said, can you prove that? And I said, yeah. And I took out her uh, birth certificate. When I had Luna, because there was only one parent, I was advised by my midwife to put zero information about. In Mexico, you can put down like the grandparents and like, you know, other family members on the long form birth certificate. And I was advised not to put anyone on it, just me. Um, 
And the reason for that was that I wasn't sure who was going to be involved at that moment. And I wasn't sure who was going to be the godparents, for instance. Like if something happened to me, what would happen with Luna? And she said, better not to have people on there you want to take off later. Better just to have you. And then there can never be any problems. You never need a letter from anyone if you're the only one, right? So... I mean, she's never had a dad, so that wasn't happening. But at the time, I was in contact with her paternal, uh, biological grandparents and family. They didn't go on. My own mother didn't go on. And I'm glad I did it that way because when he asked for proof and I pulled out this document that had literally me on it and nobody else, it was great. Because he could never detain me saying, well, what about those other people and, and whatever. Or like, I don't understand this because it's in another language. What are these other names or who knows what? So that's the worst thing that's ever happened. And that was flying in to Canada that happened one time. And I had been warned by many, many Western single moms to take the birth certificate that I could be asked for proof. Um, but it was cool. He took, he barely looked at it. He glanced at it and said, cool, as long as you got proof, as long as you can prove it. Um, and he said, cause you might be asked again, so keep it with you. So that was it. Um, other than that, I've never had any problems because when you slap down a Canadian passport and match it with a white face, it's like the gold standard in the world. I mean, Canadian passport is the gold standard in the world anyway, but on top of that, you know, the way I look, you know, I'm not going to have any problems anywhere. Having said all that, it doesn't mean that I'm okay with the problems other people have. and. A huge reason why, bef even before this travel advisory with Mexico was happening, a huge reason why I've made the decision not to go to the States with Luna is because, you know, she's Mexican. She was born here. She identifies as Mexican. She sees herself as a, as a Latina young woman. I know there's been some people on here that say, you know, they don't like the word Latina, but I don't care. It, it's a good descriptor for me. Um, it works in this, in this situation. And... Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want her to see what they're doing to Guatemalans, to other Latin people. I, I don't want her to see her brothers and sisters in cages. I don't feel like those people are different than me. I feel like that could be me. I feel like women are being discriminated against all over the world, regardless of the color of their skin. I feel like when they discriminate against, you know, my brothers and sisters of another race, that I also feel that as a wrong like it's wrong it's against humans and I am a human and I don't want to participate in that and because I have the privilege of not having to go I feel like it's my duty to choose not to if that makes sense so to final to sum, summarize your question have I had problems no have I traveled by land lots do I think that people are having problems all over the world? Absolutely. I did, you know, on my way back from Spain, the guy at, at the border in Barcelona asked me why I was, if I was going to Mexico for a trip. And I said, no, I live in Mexico. And he said, why? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean, why? And he was like, but you're Canadian. And he said, yeah. And he said, so why do you live in Mexico? And I was like, what do you mean? It's amazing. And I realized he asked me three times, but you're Canadian, why do you live there? And I realized he was saying, you know, but you're from a rich white country. Why would you live in that like poor brown one? That's what he was saying. And I was like, I love Mexico. I'm immigrating. I have a Mexican child. Viva la Mexico. And he just laughed and said, okay. Okay, I'm being summoned. That is the end of this question. More to come. Luna. What do you have to say, bubs? Who are you? What's your name? No, you don't have a name? They don't call you anything? Why do they call you on the prison yard? Here's a great question that I get a lot. Is it hard to find childcare for Luna while traveling and how do I do it? It comes from Kathy and Copy, who is a Canadian living in Costa Rica. How do I do it? 
I have a really simple formula. I mostly just sign up for Airbnbs where we're gonna be living in a shared house where the owner lives on site and is local. Come over here. That way, they either have children of their own or if they're elderly, their grandparents, or they know a single mom, they always know, locals know where the people who can help you are. They know where you can buy diapers or specialty children's products. Those are the people you wanna, wanna go to. So I always stay in locally run places and I always rent a room so I'm not by myself. And I usually write to them on Airbnb and say, hey, I'm coming with a kid. Do you know of a good daycare? Do you know of babysitting? Hold my hand. And they help me out in advance. I even stayed in Mexico City with um, a guy, Cesar, uh, for a month. And he's a single guy, unmarried, not into women. And asked him in advance, he doesn't have any children, do you know if there's a daycare nearby that's good? Can he help me out? I want to suss it out in advance. And he found me a daycare and all that before we even arrived. He asked around. You know, he's local, he knows what's there and found us a really great place. And it turned out to be one of the daycares that Luna loved the most. I also start slow. Sometimes I just put her in for a couple hours, see how she likes it. We do a week. If she hates it after a week, I take her somewhere else. But usually after a week, she loves it and we stay. I also don't really like allow for this to be an option. I'm a single working mom. We use childcare and daycare. I try to find something for her that she loves, but it's a non-negotiable for me. I also need time for myself and, um, and time to work, like I said. So I think that childcare while traveling is a necessity. It's not an option for me. Even if I was a couple, even if it was just a vacation, I would still find time to be on my own. So thanks for that question. They're baby chicks. the Puerto, Puerto Escondido Mercado and they sell flowers and pool toys and they have a lot of music and also food and everything your heart could ever desire. It's all here. It's all happening. It's all definitely happening here. So Arshke Grewa, I don't know if I said that right, from Toronto, Canada, my hometown, wrote in and asked if Luna's paternal, look at that art, paternal biological family is in the picture at all? The short answer is no. The long answer is after two years of like begging for a healthy relationship of some sort with her biological father, he just never showed up. He wouldn't see her unless he could see me and his family really supported that type of abusive behavior and they have a saying in Spanish that goes la misma raza and it's like the apple, it's kind of like in English when we say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Like, he had no interest in his kid. He's never phoned her. He's never wished her a happy birthday. You know, when we left Guatemala, once they knew we were leaving Guatemala, not one of them even wished her a happy Christmas. So, meh, it's their loss. At this point, I think she's probably gonna grow up in Mexico here, feeling Mexican, identifying as Mexican, and then at some point in her life, I'm sure she's going to want to find out her birth story, like same as an adopted kid, and I will support her in that. And anytime she asks questions, which now is never, she hasn't asked about him or his family or anyone in it in about six months. So if she does ask, I answer. She asks to call, I make the call. No one ever answers. She kind of stopped asking for that and uh, you know I think it's one of those things where it's like sadder for us as adults to hear that Mommy. than it is for her to experience it okay Caro Zuniga 9 from originally from Costa Rica San Jose Costa Rica asked me how did I learn Spanish did I take classes am I still learning how did I learn it Yo puedo hablar en español, pero mi español es como más o menos intermediate, if you understand that. Luna, on the other hand, was a natural Spanish speaker, stopped speaking and is now learning it again. She's more frustrating than me. How did I learn Spanish initially? I used Duolingo a lot in the very beginning. I took some classes 
and I try to make Spanish friends. Also, a lot of people I know use Tinder and Bumble. In Latin America, they're not just like hookup apps. So yeah, Duolingo, dating online, it's totally normal to use Tinder down here or Bumble. Um, women do not, generally speaking, sleep with men on the first date, so you can definitely go out and just enjoy yourselves. It's not like the same hookup app. I know a lot of people that have learned lots and lots and lots of Spanish through Tinder because they just go out, meet people, you know, practice their Spanish. Dating is a great way to practice your Spanish. I'm now taking lessons again because I don't know the past tense at all and I have a lot of lazy habits. I also make up words like obvioso, which is not a word, and other like conjugating verbs because I think it sounds right. So I'm back in lessons, but my lessons are mainly conversational. Uh, I recommend Duolingo because if you're super beginner, Duolingo, you know, it's five minutes a day and it will teach you how to say left, right, order on a menu, really basic stuff, hello, goodbye, thank you, please, the things you really need in every country to get by and it's Spanish, it's not that hard, it's not that hard to learn it by ear, it's harder to write it and to conjugate verbs, but the basics, super easy and I think a friend of mine Actually, this girl, Brittany, who owns a really great shoe store called Ushi Ball in Antigua, Guatemala, she told me, you know what, if you just keep having Spanish-speaking friends and keep trying, like in two years, you'll just get it. And that's kind of worked for me. And the final amazing question from Glimpy, who lives in New Jersey and the United States, she said, or she asked, if you could time travel and go anywhere, where would you go and when? And I thought this was a fantastic question. I thought about it for days. You know, I don't know. There are so many places I would go and so many times, but I think I would really like to, like, I think more like eras in countries. Like, I would love to check out the states sort of like 1968 to 71 you know like i'd love to see um led zeppelin in concert around that time like kind of you know protest the vietnam war you know see martin luther king like the 60s is the time i feel like the era i would love to see new york in the late 70s era like punk era esg you know, Blondie, the beginning of rap music, like what, and it's still like, you know, a really kind of messed up city, which is how I kind of like my cities. That would be really cool. I would absolutely love to see Paris in the like 80s uh, and 90s. I would also love to go to Japan at that time. I would love to see Thailand in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s and check out Southeast Asia at that time. You know, uh, I will say that most of the places I go in the world, I can tell that I wasn't there at the right time. Um, you know, I was, I did at least get to experience Europe before the Euro when it was a lot more fun. Do you want me to come in with you? And I think I would love, as far as Paris goes, I'd love to be there in the 30s as well. The Roaring Twenties could be a cool time. I need a towel. But it would definitely be the last century. The last century for sure. Everything from the 90s and before, but be the age I am now. I gotta go, because somebody needs a towel, and it's time for me to get in that pool. Well, if you like this video, like it. If you want to share it, I'm not against that. You can click the little bell and get notifications for when we upload again. And uh, yeah, like it, share it, get the notifications, ding some stuff. And adios, baby. Are you going to come down? Can you say adios, baby? Adios, baby. <laughs> I'm ballerina. I'm ballerina.